Hello everybody, thanks for tuning in to Revolutionary Lumpen Radio. In this episode we're pleased to be joined by an artist, filmmaker, propagandist and a good principal comrade, James from Pro Cult Films. Welcome to the podcast, James. Hello comrade, it's a pleasure to be on and to have the chance to talk to you both. I'd be quite fond of this project and I think it's a really good medium for us all to have a proper discussion. No, same, same. So, I'm personally fangirling a little bit because to me your films should be a part of the British national curriculum it should be a part of education as standard I mean obviously it's filled with historical social philosophical insight and I think that if it was part of the national curriculum I think everybody would be like scientific socialists and would generally be a species of progression rather than recession also, the films as well, can I just say, are incredibly fun, but they're also, again, highly educational for anybody who wants to learn the fundamentals of Marxist tradition, theories, history. For example, like a dying culture is just, just wow when it does all of that. It's mind-blowing, doing an amazing service for Marxism, the current era, and for future Marxists. Very much for the kind words on the project. I never ever know how to respond to praise, but it does mean a lot to me. I'm quite profoundly moved whenever anyone says that the project's impacted upon them or that it's changed any of their politics or that they've had a positive response to it. Because, yeah, no, like I've been writing for over 10 years now, and like to have a response has only really started happening in the last sort of three. And that's just quite incredible to me. Wow, absolutely. You deserve it all, honestly. Mm. And more, as well as anybody else who's worked on the project, uh, I do take me hat off to them and you deserve a fraternal kiss. Thank you. <laughs> That's a socialist fraternal kiss for anybody who doesn't know. Okay, so on with the show. Let's move on to the introduction now. This is where all of us get to know the comrade behind the voice that we all love so much. So can you just start off by telling us a little bit about your background? Yeah, so I'm, I'm from the northeast of England. Uh, you can't tell from my accent, but I'm actually from Newcastle originally. Um, and um, <laughs> in terms of my background, uh, I am technically lumpen proletariat for most of my life. I come from a, like a, a disabled family with like a, quite a long experience with the benefits system. I did quite a lot of uh, activism in Newcastle when I sort of started turned 18. I was initially politicised around the Occupy movement and the student movements that sort of preceded it, um, which were diff very different experiences, but that eventually led me to conclude that anarchism and liberalism are the same thing and they're both pointless um, in, in Britain at the very least. I think that, you know, there's a broader thing there, but that's a longer discussion. Um, but it also got me a lot of practical experience. And I think learning politics from practical mm -hmm. stuff is like a really important thing that is really, really helpful. I then was active in a couple of organisations um, on the British left, uh, Marxist organisations, and primarily did anti-austerity work in Newcastle, which brought me into a lot of t contact with a lot of very poor people, um, poorer than myself, although I am, as I say, have lived on benefits for quite a lot of my life. And doing a lot of activism around that and also anti-immigration uh, anti law work, yeah. anti-racist work to combat the Brit British uh, immigration laws. Did a lot of that, um, got, came into contact with a lot of asylum seekers through that and that's really how I started to form my politics um, and that led to me to kind of study and try and understand the why things were they were in a lot more of a concerted way. I then, after after a while, I, I, I kind of moved away from the northeast to come and live in the Midlands with my partner. And uh, yeah, since then I've kind of been, I met the people who are involved, Alex, who's involved in Prolocourt. And uh, yeah, that that's kind of the foundation of that. In terms of other things that people want to know, I, I never know, really know what to say about myself. I'm, I'm quite a nerd, um, really. Like, I like statistics. I like reading i've always liked those things i've liked history all my life those kind of things never been particularly academically inclined in the bourgeois sense but i've always tried to kind of try and understand the world for a practical reason and yeah 
I guess any other things you want to know, ask away. That was like really interesting. I think it will come as a surprise for so many that you spent so much time on benefits. You were lump in class because of just how eloquent you are, how productive you are intellectually on the pro cult films and other projects. Just so nobody thinks we're being like sectarian or anything, just cover a box here. It is just a matter of a fact that it's not the anarchism is the same as liberalism and we're just saying that because we don't like anarchists what it is is just anarchists generally lack a sense of the scientific method of dialectical materialism and that's a, the historical process of understanding the world and society i generally tend to think that they're sort of like half correct insofar as they've like correctly identified the problem in some ways they just don't correctly identify the solutions if that makes sense yeah i think that's that's fair to say about anarchism it's not that like i i, I kind of want to make a division here because there's two types of anarchist i've met in britain um one's more mainstream and tends to come from like university backgrounds and then there's the kind of people who are on benefits and i think it does come down to class because like the anarchists i've met who are like more kind of lower down in the class are always pretty sound and have pretty good politics and will always kind of back you up when it matters. Um, whereas the university kind of base stuff is like they've read the bread book and like, you know, mm -hmm. th those are still interesting things to read and learn about. But I do think that we have to say that like it does come down to class and it's not just anarchism either. This is a problem on a lot of the so-called Marxist left as well, which uh, kind of has a more bourgeois outlook. Yeah, and it's important to distinguish between those two things because, like, Kropotkin's one I really struggle with because he was a prince. Like, that's something that's worth knowing, you know. <laughs> like, right. wow, <laughs> that's news to me. Yep, Prince Kropotkin. <laughs> hmm. Holy shit! Wow, an interesting perspective there. Thank you for that. And this is coming from your practical knowledge of the world and what you've experienced. I haven't spent that much time with an anarchist over me time when I have. I mean, we've been at the same events, we've done the same thing. It's never been like an ideological distinction. You know, it, all of that is, is primarily online. And we just can't turn anybody away from revolution because, I, I mean, as you said, uh, there's problems with Marxists as well. We, we're lacking vision, we're lacking direction, we're lacking a plan, just to be fair. I think what it is, is just like a cross section of all people ultimately who see politics as like an aesthetic. They like wear it like a winter jacket. You know what I mean? It, it's not real to them. It's not material to them. Instead, it's like window dressing. It's an, it's, it's an aesthetic. It's like a way to like brand or market themselves. Like you could underline all of this would say, learn dialectical materialism learn historical materialism i mean it is the theory of revolution this is what makes you a scientific socialist people are happy to be socialists but you've got to actually be willing to read to learn pro cold films he's not doing that for nothing you know <laughs> go and watch pro cold films and that start start off going through all their videos you're gonna pick up a lot of what dialectical materialism is and i say it in the introduction that james is a principled comrade and principled Marxist and that is because of he's an organic intellectual when you become a Marxist a dialectical materialist then you're kind of all on the same page you see analyze world events news events how people interact in your street you analyze it all the same you're scientific whereas like a lot of people in the world like live in an alternate reality in the head yeah, and I think that's a really important thing to say. Like, we don't want to turn away any tendency um, from the kind of struggle, and it, but it does come down to, like, what your methodology is and how you consider what you're doing. So, like, dialectics, uh, dialectical materialism to me is, and, and Marxism are identical things in that they are the partisan scientific world outlook of the proletariat. So it's not that there aren't other perspectives on things. There absolutely are. It's just that this is the scientific kind of viewpoint of the working class that can advance it, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And it also stops your, you know, politics end up like being an aesthetic, right? Because it actually grounds your politics in something real other than, you know, this is how you get certain people on the left with sort of really strange and weird takes it's because they haven't they haven't actually got like the philosophical framework that all their ideas are based from 
so it's they're sort of detached from reality in mm-hmm. a way it's just sort of you know i think this but it's not actually grounded in anything real talking in terms of power where the power is who's shaping the condition of our lives who determines the quality of the air we breathe the food we eat the water we drink the kind of jobs we can have the images we have to deal with and such the culture that it impacts us so like when we say read theory or learn theory, what that means, just to clarify for that, for anybody who doesn't really know, is like all theory is, is people's life experiences, like Marxist life experiences, and they wrote it down. So Lenin done a revolution, literally did it. He wrote it down. He wrote the whole thing down, what he thought at the time. Mao done the exact same thing, wrote it down. Even George Jackson, you know, what it was like to be a black revolutionary incarcerated for so long. That's all Marxist theory is. It's reading other people's life story and it's undeniable. It's not like an, like a dogma or, or like reading the Bible. It's nothing like that. Um, and obviously people have different opinions on things and that's why you have to do a scientific analysis and that. But I mean, it, it's definitely like, life experience right but it's also like an object an objective understanding of the systems that govern everything around us and there's always that interplay between the two right there's always like the individual versus society and the interplay there but yeah i mean there, there definitely is you know a sort of autobiographical aspect to it of like people's lives but there also has to be a sort of objective reading of the systems that govern you know society and and the institutions around us Um, because if you don't correctly identify the problem you can't correctly arrive at the right solution so that's why you know it's important to actually get an analysis of capital correct because otherwise if your analysis isn't correct then your solutions will be correct yeah just quickly like marx's theory is like i think we have a, a tendency to on a lot of the kind of online left, there's a tendency to either understate or overstate the importance of theory. And it comes down to this kind of bizarre debate where it's like, read theory becomes short, shorthand for like, read this text by Comrade Stalin in 1939 kind of thing, uh, which isn't helpful. Like, um, because on the one hand, yeah, we need to have the methodology, the way we approach the world. And we all need to study that and like actually grasp, grapple with like what the kind of concrete elements of Marxism are. Um, and what that means like for understanding class struggle. But at the same time, if you take any kind of text in isolation, you're quite rec- right to say that it's uh, shibby, that it's like bound to its context. It's not removable from its context because otherwise it wouldn't be Marxism, right? <laughs> like what I always mean by read theory isn't just read Karl Marx. I also mean like read how many poor people there are in your area right now. Read like what their conditions of life are because then you can get a better understanding of either why they aren't resisting or what conditions they live in or what the kind of direction or or that resistance could take, what unifying points there are in your community to like build something concrete that can actually struggle against the forces that are attacking people. That's more what I mean by read theory is like, I think we should be saying read theory and study reality as kind of two prongs of the same intervention rather than just read this book by Lenin, because you end up in a kind of spiral where we're trying to replicate something that happened and was successful in Tsarist Russia, which is a very different text for a number of reasons. But prime, one of the most, one of the key reasons is mm-hmm. the working class in the context of Tsarist Russia was actually very literate and read a lot of political theory. That's not so much the case for most working classes across the globe now. And it's not that they're not literate. It's just that we're drowning in a culture that kind of suggests otherwise, if that makes sense. Sure. And I mean, theory is only useful insofar as it guides correct praxis, right? So this is why, you know, just reading theory for the sake of reading theory is completely meaningless and pointless. And you shouldn't be doing that. There's no there's no end goal to that. Say you want to produce a material, are you going to just go back to the Bronze Age, go back to the Iron Age because you want a certain material or are you going to use scientific development on materials and maybe use like carbon fiber because it's more efficient? Marxist today, the way they approach Marxist theory and, and also the practice from that theory, it's so backwards. It's like you're trying to return to an era where the materials 
a different and I'm talking materials in like an iron age when we're living in the year 2021. You know what I'm saying? So you have to keep advancing and developing your theory with the material conditions rather than being stuck in the past. I think it's it's one of those things that like, like, yeah, you're right. Theory is a guide to, to action. And that's the key thing here. Um, and it's not that reading these texts is bad or counterproductive. Like I think that everyone should be reading like Marx particularly. Um, but they're not like capable of answering all the questions you're going to come across with a quotation. Cause that, that's, that's, that's dogma and like a religious attitude to what we're talking about. Not, what these people were attempting to achieve and in fact Mm -hmm. if the only thing i can say for certain about what marx or lenin or any of these figures would say today um when confronted with the left is why are you quoting something i wrote about like class struggle in 1914 (laughs) to answer a question that is about really concrete now um why haven't you done the statistical research why haven't you done the the concrete yeah. research about how class is composed now to understand it, if that makes sense. Absolutely. I mean, it's a, it, it is why you say it's a science, it keeps developing, you know, just like the Darwin's theory of, of evolution tells us, you know, this is how animals and that evolve. Marxist theory tells us this is how human animals and the society evolves. And also, obviously, capital and all that's important because we still live under capitalism. Lenin's extremely important because imperialism's still going on. It's like literally prophetic in so many ways. But obviously, there's so many new things going on in the world that I think we we do need to advance our strategy because the workers have got a completely different relation over capital than they did have back in those days. I mean, when all these industries were just starting up, the workers had the chance to either get get into the flow of this new system or actually just say no actually we're not going to start doing that whereas today industrialization is so standard and everybody relies on uber eats and all these delivery foods and most of the time we we, we rely on technology so we can't it's just something to think about if i had all the answers we'd have a revolution tomorrow but <laughs> we've got to start somewhere i think that's a really important point though like um in the past like in the era that like both marx and lenin were writing we're talking about a very concentrated section of the industrial working class so like in britain people working in factories at the height of industrialization was like 30 to 40 percent of the population and they not only had like collective working environments where their experience of reality was incredibly generalized so you know everyone went to the factory at the same time everyone kind of had that same experience of the working day which makes it very easy to form a common unity around they also had like their hands directly on the productive forces where we're now living in a context where a lot of those industrial forces are sent sent out to oppressed world but even in the oppressed world we're talking about huge shrinks and deindustrialization as those ma- machines become more and more productive which means less people have their hands upon them so actually the the industrial faction of the proletariat the kind of leading fraction of the class as marx and lenin saw it increasingly doesn't exist um and so that's a really difficult problem to get our heads around like in britain now like 80% of the workforce work in services. Yeah. And like, you can't seize the means of production if you work in the production as a shop mm-hmm. because like it doesn't actually produce anything. Right. So this gets to like um, post Fordism, right? This is the difference between like Fordism and post Fordism. You know, the idea that like in the old days, there used to be the sort of old traditional, like you said, hands on Ford production line, assembly line, where everyone was there doing the thing. Um, and that's not the world we live in now. You know, I think. When we read, you know, Capitalist Realism for um, A Theory Thursday, I think they literally, like, traced post-Fordism down to a specific date. Yeah, they did. And it's, you know, it's all about... I mean, you've essentially just described it perfectly right there without knowing you've described it, essentially, which is, like, you know, how the productive forces were either distributed in such a way that everything becomes highly specialised or just shipped abroad entirely. And the industry becomes, you know, sort of service-sized instead of um, an actual sort of pr- production. Um, it's, uh, and, and that's 
something that we actually have to deal with, right? Because if you just read Marx and try to apply that entirely to today, you would under, you, you would quickly realize that it's not it's not going to work that way, right? Because the economy that we see in you know sort of twenty twenty one England is obviously not the economy that Marx was talking about in you know eighteen nineties Germany or wherever it was, London maybe. To tie all of that together, and then obviously the purpose of this goddamn podcast project, and this is why myself, the Black Panthers, you know, so many others are saying there's revolutionary p- potential in the lumpen proletariat. One, because there's so many of them. Two, because workers are becoming increasingly lumpenized. And three, it's the fact that we live in globalization, and so much of the industrial production is out in other countries. And I mean, Brazil. Uruguay, if you've ever worked in fast food, you, you get deliveries and it tells you where it's from. It's from all over the world. It's spread out, this production, so you can't seize the means of production if all of your produce is coming from, from Brazil. You know what I'm saying? And this is the reality that we're living in. So, I mean, obviously, I'm being a bit more radical, saying the lump and are brave and are willing to actually fight for revolution. And that might be what it's going to take. But we say, I mean, we it's not as simple as... Um, just unionizing and then going on strike agitation rather than there's any practical thing you could do about it i don't know i mean i'd like to be proven wrong of course well i think like it's i think that's correct like basically well i hope that's correct i think my attitude is the lumpen has to be a revolutionary section of the class or we are fucked right <laughs> yeah. um there's so many of them as well yeah yeah and it's it's not something that marx didn't write about as well like he because what you know what we see on prolocot a lot of the time is we're living through a final breakdown of capitalism and that manifests in this increasing tendency to dispossess masses of the class in a way that's never been seen before um and leads to a situation of if left to its own devices uh, without class struggle kind of being taken into consideration taken in purely an abstract sense Um, the tendency of capital is tending toward like a complete monopoly where the overwhelming majority of humanity own nothing. And that is a really difficult situation because on the one hand, that compels people toward revolutionary politics like never before. But on the other hand, it becomes very hard to articulate what the points of unity are and like how to organize in such a way as to gain like a political advantage or power. Because not only is that kind of process of dispossession and and removing us from the the, the kind of means of production and removing more and more people from having access to them directly, like really happening, at the same time you have like the destruction of communities, huge kind of atomization and individualization of individual kind of proletarian subjects, which makes that unity very difficult to form. I think it's like quite a long discussion that's quite hard to come to any conclusions on but it's something that we're kind of thinking about at the moment and the journal end notes write about quite a lot i think they're a bit ultra left and quite chauvinistic a lot of the time unfortunately but they do have a point when they say that like political movements today are expressions of mass outpourings of anger about what we're against but not so much about what we're for whereas in the past it was much easier to argue that like we want higher wages, we want less work hours, that that becomes a much more abstract demand, given that like huge sections of the working class are only employed through the gig economy, or huge sections of the working class are completely dispossessed. And that makes politics much harder in some ways. Yeah, oh my God. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what I've been saying for ages. I even did a video on that exact point, right? I call it the politics of the anti. And it's basically just this whole idea that everyone these days knows what they're against, but they don't really know what they're for. So even if you track like Main Street, like the political positions of mainstream, like party politics, everyone's always against something, right? So you've always got like, you know, they're either anti-climate change or they're anti-mask or they're anti-abortion or they're anti-gun or they're anti right so like every like the entire political landscape is essentially comprised of people who know what they're against but they lack imagination to be able to know what they're for and i put this down to like capitalist realism right it's the idea that like capital has restricted our imagination so much that people don't know what they're for anymore because that requires imagination and actually thinking instead 
they're presented with things that they see around them. And it's really easy to be against those things, right? So you can see people wearing masks and it's really easy to be against that, right? You can see people with guns and just include, oh, I'm against that, right? It's really easy to be against things, but it's actually much harder to build things and be for things, you know? And the same thing is true of like, even like material things like a sandcastle, like what's it harder to do? Is it harder to build a sandcastle or just kick one down, right? It's, it's so much easier to kick one down. It's infinitely easier. Yeah, and I think it's partially like the ideological kind of context for things like the future has been obliterated, right? That's something that capitalism has distinctively done. And even people who claim that they have a solution, like one of my favorite kind of examples for this is Aaron Bastani's book, Fully Automated, luxury communism which like won't work because what he's proposing is this but more and more equal um which doesn't solve any of the problems it's like we'll outsource our pollution to asteroids to keep this kind of form of consumption going and that doesn't work um and i think the, the kind of problematic is is kind of quite hard because on the one hand there's been an expectation i think among a lot of more kind of traditional or orthodox kind of Marxism that we would reach a point where like the means of production would reveal the next stage of development and that would just simply happen and whereas actually it's much more complicated because we need a new mode of production which is like much harder to imagine so a lot of kind of emphasis gets laid on automation without much thought being gone into like how it would be applied or even what it's actually capable of doing because it's not capable of eliminating human labor because you still need people to like program and run the machines and repair them and things like that. Would that be better is like kind of quite a difficult question. Would it be viable in a resource sense is the more important question to my mind given the environmental crisis. And so you actually emerge at a point where it's really difficult to say what a new mode of production could or would look like just because of like that expectation that the means of production would just show us it kind of pr has kind of proven itself to be false whilst the expectation that the means of production would reach a certain point of development where capital can't develop them has proven correct so it's it's quite a difficult contradiction i think Right. And I think this is kind of what I was talking about earlier between like the dialectic, I suppose, between the individual and society, right? Like uh, these things don't just arrive. They don't just sort of come to us. They arrive out of the actions of humans. This is how we get sort of full circle about the individual and society, right? The interplay there is that, you know, there's nothing on the planet but people ultimately i mean obviously there are animals and everything but i mean in like human society there's nothing but people so when we talk about things like capitalism those are groups of people so it, it's the actions of human beings that are ultimately going to change how things work and how things function you ultimately can't just like sit around and wait for you know history to change itself on you i mean history is ultimately changed by the actions of people doing things right yeah well said absolutely yeah very well said yeah, good points there. Brought a lot out. Really interesting. I think we could move on now to Paul Cole Films and your productions. So I think you touched on it briefly, but where did you... <laughs> and in fact, I think that this would be interesting for people who probably don't know. But where did the name for Paul Cole come from? And how did the project start? So it's a reference to um, an art, art, probably the primary revolutionary arts movement of the Bolshevik Revolution that was began outside of the Bolshevik Party and was a mass movement of workers learning to write, to create theatre, create films. And we're referring back to that movement, uh, which ran from just before the revolution kind of seized power up until about 1936, when the laws on socialist realism were agreed at the 1936 Writers' Congress in the Soviet Union. Now, that movement produced some incredible artists who I have a huge amount of regard for, including Sergei Eisenstein. It was the result of a number of theor theorists as well, like Dagnov, and it essentially posited a kind of mass participative culture as a real proletarian culture rather than any aesthetic principles. And I think that's correct. There were problems with the movement that like, I would like to go into uh, perhaps a little but the overwhelming importance was that it was getting people involved in ideological expression in ideological kind of construction and really really did hold huge sway 
among the working class in Russia in the immediate preface and immediate aftermath of the Bolshevik revolution. That's awesome. I really think that that's so fitting. I think that you do the name uh, justice and carrying on that legacy. Thank you. But it's something that we're trying to build more of as well, because like on, on our Discord, we, we do reading groups and things, but we also have like a collaboration channel, channel where people can like work on projects together and talk about these things. I think one of the things is like the working class generally is for like really ideologically de-skilled intentionally. Like they don't let us have access to these kind of forms of production very often. Mm. Working class novels are very rarely published. I mean, e even the, the fact that there is any history of working class literature in Britain is a result of the First World War, where working class people had to learn to write so they could tell their mums they're still alive. Like, And that fact really stuck with me when I learned that, was like, oh, so holy shit, we wouldn't have had any ideological capacity to produce, really. We would have had some, but not masses. And that's really kind of quite stark. And in the preface to kind of the First World War, where working class literature kind of came into being as an actual discrete entity in Britain, the only kind of like proletarian literature that existed in Britain was the result of socialist schools. For example, uh, John McLean ran uh, socialist schools in Scotland. And he's probably the most important revolutionary Britain's produced, in my opinion. And yeah, it's a really important matter that we distribute those skills. And thank you for saying that we're, we're really kind of contributing to that because, yeah, the, the aim isn't just to give like my voice a platform, but like to try and build up as many platforms as we can, because it's that kind of plurality that's going to give us our strength. Yeah, I'm totally with you. Right. And obviously I'm backing you all day long. I'm, you know, I'm a flipping patron and everybody else should be. It's only a little dollar. That was an interesting point that I don't think a lot of people learned of the, how the workers only started learning to like read, write. And during World War One, and you know, they they started to write poetry as well. You know, quite simple. You don't have to be dead comprehensive and write an essay. You know, you could just say a few words. But once that goes back, that says so much more because yeah, the context in which it came from. So, how did the project start? Like, how did it actually start? Like, when did you decide to do it? You know, could you go from there? Yeah. Um, so I'd just gotten out of a fucking horrible job like the worst job I think I've ever had. Don't work for the petty bourgeoisie. They're actually worse than the big companies in a lot of ways because they like they know you and their spite is personally directed, whereas a big company is just going to like do it in a bureaucratic way, which is kind of less intense. Mm. So I worked for, I was a quote, well, I was called a marketing manager for this company. I was actually on minimum wage and uh, the marketing department was me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I left that um, and I, I, I was kind of quite like, wow. okay, this, this is shit. I moved to, that was when I moved away from the Northeast after leaving that job. And I came into contact with Alex through, um, through kind of personal relations. And we'd known each other a couple of years and she used to do editing on like wedding wedding videos and things like that and um, we were both like agreed quite a lot on politics um mm. and like i was already like a marxist alex wasn't quite so sure at that point and then i just sort of like, one day was like I, I was writing um stuff for a blog at that point in time wasn't getting much attention been doing that and i ran a different art kind of project in Newcastle whilst I was doing, whilst I was there as well, um, a different kind of attempt to do similar to what Protocol did, is trying to do in terms of building up like mass participation in the arts and things, but more kind of, we had like a little magazine we'd hand out and stuff. Um, and that, that sort of worked, but it never really got off the ground. And so I kind of was writing some poetry and things. And then I decided like, it would be cool to do like a video poem at the end of this, because like maybe that would get more of an audience. So I asked Alex if she wanted to work on that. And that's kind of how we got started as an extension of kind of other projects I was working on. And then I realized that like you could do so much more with video and Alex got like much more enthusiastic about like kind of the politics behind what we were doing. And so we decided to keep going to build the project. Um, and we did two video poems for most of that first year. And then we decided like, um, at the time, I'd been studying a lot around 
like it was just after the Skripal poisoning that we started doing this kind of stuff together. And I've been studying a lot about that. And I realized like a lot of the conclusions that we present in History is Marching out of that kind of our first do documentary in that kind of research. And I was like, no one's talking about the fact that we're drifting toward the world war. Maybe we should make a documentary about that. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I remember, yeah. Um, and that, that kind of, once we released that, we got such a good response to it. Like, unlike anything, I, any kind of response I've had to any work I've done in sort of the 10 years I've been writing and the sort of, eight years I've been writing politically that I was just like, okay, well, this is what I have to do then. Um, and yeah, from there, it just kind of got started properly. And we, we started doing, we set up the Patreon after, after that and kind of formalized things. And then we've just been going since. Cool. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Funny that I remember we were talking about World War Three. Was it, was it Iran? Was it North Korea? I can't even remember, but yeah, it was in the papers and everything, wasn't it? The fucking fear that he'd fucking play on you is insane. Like, Trump's going to start World War Three, But, I mean, we're already going through World War Three. God damn it, this is imperialism across the globe in every other nation with every other nation attacking the global south. It's the northern hemisphere versus the southern hemisphere. Make no mistake about it. Yeah, and it was just one of those things where I was like, so it's kind of maddening when you see things and you're like, you realize like what the military generals are actually like saying like it's worth reading because they are madder than you can possibly imagine like they are gone they are living in a fantasy world of like like high energy high octane stuff that won't work as well like this is the other thing this is the big little thing like so I, I don't really talk about this so much, but they, they go on about smart weapons and smart technology. And I don't know if everyone kind of remembers there was uh, after the, a gas, uh, a, a false flag or a gas attack in Syria, there was a number of smart missiles. I think it was a hundred smart missiles launched at Syria by America, France, and Britain, and every single like all but two were shot down with an old Soviet anti-aircraft defense because the technology doesn't really work. So like. Yeah, all these people are living in a really bizarre fantasy world that's only like pushing things worse and it's making things worse. And it's just a really, really bizarre process. And it's really scary. And it, because, because of how just normalized it is that we're in this perpetual forever war and how that simultaneously makes it acceptable for it to escalate. And doesn't and, and leads people into hysteria without ever forming into any kind of resistance against that process is really quite a terrifying concoction of things. I was gonna say that also sort of tangents pretty well with the idea that like, you know, humanity is just constantly on a upward trajectory of improvement, right? That we're just always getting better no matter what. Things are always better now than they were before. There are you know, literal intellectuals in the sort of Gramscian sense, I suppose, people like Steven Pinker that came out with that book. I don't know if any of you know about it, like The Better Angels of Our Nature. It was basically this book just about like how great we are and how fantastic the world is and how much we've lowered poverty and everything. And it was just this like giant blowjob to like <laughs> neoliberalism essentially in, in countries that, you know, in the imperial poor. And it was just about, you know, how everything's great and fantastic and we're so awesome. Thanks. It was disastrous. Yeah, and that kind of logic is really dangerous because whilst the whilst all the intellectuals of bourgeois society are saying that kind of stuff, you've got the generals get convincing themselves that if you send a bad text, then that's an act of war. Like it's mm, that right. it's that kind of contrast. Like there's the campaign against war robots or deadly robots or something like that in the US and that's been going for a few years and they make the really good point that there's not a single piece of technology that the United States has developed that it hasn't immediately then tried to weaponize and mm. that's that's the same in Britain that's the same in in any imperialist country um and and that's a really like stark reality that we have to face mm. up to is that like Twitter to them, for example, or Facebook or any of these things aren't just means of communication. They're objects that can be used for information warfare and be used to do any number of things. And they have like really wordy theories to express this to such an extent that now I think the generals of imperialist society have genuinely internalized it, that literally anything is an act of war. And it's that quite bizarre way of viewing the world that we're contending with.
they also just like openly admit it. Like I'm big into science. Like I've got tons of science books. I read up on quantum mechanics and all that jazz, right? And um, everyone knows Neil deGrasse Tyson, right? Like he's like a very famous science educator, essentially. And I remember he has a podcast called Star Talk, which is basically just him chatting science with other people. And um, he wrote this book about like science and the military industrial complex. And he goes off on this huge rant about like what? Yeah, he does. He has not qualified to be like talking about that. No, or I've seen him on uh, Russell Brand's podcast and he's chat shit. He he is though. Here's why. Because this dude, he is like he has contracts with the CIA and all this oh jazz. My he's God. like No, because here's the thing, this is exactly what the book is about. Like there is a, a complete interlocking of science and the military industrial complex. And he talks about that's what this whole book is about. It's about like you know, how the State Department and the CIA are essentially the forefront of technological advancement, right? That's what DARPA mm-hmm. is, right? The Defense Agency Research, whatever the rest of the initials stand for. And he basically just gives us this like huge book about like how great it is for science to be on the, that the military is the forefront of like science and technological advancement. And essentially that is the driving force of technology that is why technology advances right because it's all about they want faster better stronger weapons and essentially if you look at like any great scientific advancement there's been a military reason for it right like i mean even if you look at why the united states went to the moon it was because of course the ussr was going to the moon and suddenly uh, now it's a space race now it's a military project right now the state department comes in and it's all right so it's like it's it's this just constant sort of militarization of of everything Mm. um and also the idea that like technology has a class component right people don't think of like technology as being almost an institution essentially but like everything in a class society has a class component and technology is not distinct from that you know technology today is used to track people it's used to advertise to people it's used to surveil people and this is why there is a, a fusion of um silicon valley and the government, right? That's that's how that works. They do that. That's how they use it. This is why, you know, Facebook and Twitter are at this point, essentially, you know, extensions of the government and, and, and extensions of the CIA, essentially. Um, you know, I talked to Shivy about this before, you know, the fact that there's a department in the military here in the UK, there is a, a brigade in the army that just does cyber war. And obviously there's GCHQ, but those are like specialized things. This is just like, I think it's Brigade 177 or something. And it's just like a whole brigade of of uh, soldiers, essentially, that their whole point is just to surveil the internet and, you know, censor things, cut things out, propagandize what they want, put down what they don't want out there, right? So what initially was supposed to be marketed to us as this like great, uh, destroyer of gatekeepers, right? Oh, it's the internet. Now anyone can publish anything. You don't have to go to the, you know, sort of BBCs of the world. Now you can subvert them. They've realized that, no, wait, they, they can regain power through these mediums. And that's essentially what they're doing now. That's why we're seeing huge crackdowns on social media now. Um, over the past year, they've, you know, removed thousands of, you know, Palestinian journalist accounts, Bolivian and, you know, Venezuelan um, social media accounts. That's absolutely true, but um, I kind of want to add one thing that I think is an important point to be making here is like there's an assumption that comes in a lot of the literature that covers this, that the state is a unified body. The state is very rarely a unified body. It's a fragmented group of discrete agencies that often act counter to each other's interests to the extent where you have say CIA and FBI, both intervening in Syria for ostensibly the same purposes, train militias that then fight each other, right? That's mm-hmm. that's one example of how bizarre it can get. But I think that's a really important point because what emerged from this, right? So you have DAPR, PAM, DARPA, uh, ARPA, loads of different agencies in the United States that finance and seed tech funds and stuff, all ostensibly linked to the CIA, but loyal to individual agents within the CIA who often contradict each other even still. In Britain, you have uh, that Brigade 117, I think is the correct name, but I'd have to double check it. But you also have partisan political bodies like 
the one that was discovered in that barn in Scotland, the Integrity Initiative, that was an organ of specifically Theresa May within the Conservative Party and led to a huge amount of that kind of backlash against Corbyn and manipulate the press in that. And all of these people see journalists who may work for more than one of these people. Client journalists don't always work for just one kind of group. And so you have this, whilst it works as a form of class domination, it's increasingly divided through the point of crisis where we have actual genuine political problems arising for them. Um, because it makes all of this infrastructure that doesn't work in a coordinated way incredibly cumbersome and often counterproductive, which actually means that the tech companies, whilst they initially began as extensions of the imperialist state, and this is something that I think we do explain in our dying culture, they began as that. I think what we're increasingly seeing is actually they're starting to act independently because it's much more easy to act as a cohesive body in a corporate interest than as a state interest in a lot of ways. And I think that's really important to say because, for example, right now we can see Facebook has uh, just censored all Australian news outlets completely, won't let them post on its platform at all because the Australian government is trying to put a tax on posting of news content from Australia. Now, that that is not at all ad advantageous to the United States' Five Eyes Agreement, right? That's not at all in, in advantageous to the intelligent networks that, sure. that Australia represents to the United States. So in a way, Facebook's acting in a very counterproductive uh, way for the short-term interests, uh, for the long-term interests, rather, of US imperialism. And that's why we get this process of social crisis actually being exacerbated by the dominance of these technologies um, rather than being staved off they're kind of they've unleashed a force that they can't fully control just like the capitalists don't fully control capital right because competition exists it comes down to individual capitalists competing against each other and that drives social crises just like that the the kind of infrastructure of the internet which began in this very controlled cultural weaponized way is increasingly a chaos vector for imperialist society. Um, so I just want to throw that in because I feel like that's something that there's an there's a dangerous tendency on the online left. Not saying you were doing this at all, comrade, but if when people receive oh, yeah. all this kind of information, they go like, "Yeah, everything's a psyop," whereas actually everything is a psyop is a psyop, right? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I mean, yeah, essentially what you're talking about is like interclass warfare, right? Like people know class warfare right like between classes but people often don't understand that like there are class wars there are inter-class wars you know there are sections you know like the bourgeoisie isn't a monolith right there are sections of the bourgeoisie that are against other sections of the bourgeoisie right and that is essentially what you're describing here there are you know there, there isn't only class war between classes but there's class war in between classes like like i mean what, what it is essentially is it is a democracy if you're ruling class, if you're petty bourgeois, it's literally democracy for you. But if you don't have the economic power in order to be like socially active and do all of these things, um, if you're constantly living on a pittance, you don't have the power to enable you, obviously, to do what you want in life. But if you're wealthy, you can get into politics and you know what, you might be able to become president. And yeah, you can argue within the party, whether it's Labour or Conservatives, uh, Democrats or Republicans, you can have those ideological differences. As we know, there's still class elements at the top. We're talking the generals, we're talking the CIA directors. Like I forgot to mention this when we record them, but I think they were talking about the pig class as well that George Jackson refers to. These pig class have their own class interest in a way. And, you know, these are the ones who are more like overt fascists as well. These are the people who will never, ever deny the role that America plays. In fact, they insist on it, that they will assassinate people who protect their own resources when they nationalize them for the people. They'll just coup anybody. You know, Elon Musk made a joke about it. President Trump said, We've taken control of the oil in the Middle East, the oil that we're talking about, the oil that everybody was worried about. We have, the U.S. has control of that. He literally sent the troops there to defend the oil, you know, to go to the U.S. I mean, 
them at the top of the ruling class will never ever deny the function of like the United States. But what you have is this is where it comes down to cultural hegemony. You have this cultural hegemony over the working class and over some of the petty bourgeois who will police themselves. So when you say the United States is just evil, they'll kill anybody who gets in the way of profit. They don't want world peace. The working class people will argue each other all day long about that because they hate each other because one's communist, one's a liberal, you know, things like that. It's like, that's so ideological. But I mean, if you literally just ask like any any general, anybody in the ruling class, the CIA director is looking at a video today and, you know, he just tells you as it is, they're not shy about it. In the CIA, we didn't give a hoot about democracy. I mean, it was fine if, if a government was elected and would cooperate with us, but um, if it didn't, then democracy didn't mean a thing to us. And I don't think it means a thing today. It's the people who defend the United States and the people who don't accept that America's imperialist. Not a well-developed thought, but I think of the difference between the ruling class being so open and honest about the, the functioning of politics. But like um, the, the people will always please themselves to have like a bourgeois morality. Well, I mean, things like imperialism cross party lines, right? Like that's the whole point. I mean, when you talk about, you know, like Trump saying he wants to, you know, go in and seize the oil. I mean, Neera Tandon, you know, there were leaked emails literally saying that Neera Tandon wants the exact same thing, right? And she's supposed to be, you know, a Democrat. She's now being um, elected to the, uh, to be in charge of the Office of Management and Budget under Biden, right? Like these are obviously, you know, bipartisan affairs, essentially things like imperial uh, imperialism and um, the domination of capital, uh, they're not partisan issues, right? Like this is- I think a lot of it comes down to the mass media and this ties in with, with the next question as well. So it's the workers who are going home, who are watching BBC News, Sky News, CNN, you know, and getting all of this bullshit fed at them over like, you know, bullshit worldviews or lacking complete historical context of the situation. So you have bourgeois ideas coming from, you know, the media, social media, you know, Facebook and that, you know, you've got them changing your, your ideas. These people who are real in class don't sit down and fucking and watch the telly and watch Coronation Street and EastEnders and that. Do you know what I mean? That they live in a whole different kind of, it's like they live on another planet. Yeah, just one kind of thing to round it off. So, like, you're quite correct that, like, what the bourgeoisie agree on is class power. Like, what they agree on is imperialism and the continued oppression of the working class. Every other question is kind of up for debate among them. How much we see of that is debatable. Right. Yeah. But definitely. I think what is the key there is class power is material and that expresses itself in hegemony, which isn't just one idea, but is the, the process of kind of multiple ideas, all of which reflect certain elements of bourgeois rule and divide people and keep them in their place. That's what hegemony is. It's not it's not like everyone believes every one thing like a cult. It's more mm-hmm all these this group of ideas are the acceptable ideas of a society and these are the ones we're going to talk about and beyond that kind of relation that kind of relation class power is material right and that's important because it's important to distinguish between class as a real phenomenon that exists in the real world where bankers do disagree with each other politicians do disagree with each other about how they're going to achieve certain objectives not necessarily about what those objectives are, but certainly about how they're going to do that. And a cabal, because I think there's a, we, we can't, there's a tendency to want to simplify things a lot in our reality, try and get them across is a kind of propagandist position, which is understandable, but it's not that the ruling class are united because if they are, then we can't win. And that's a really important thing, right? Like if they Ooh. agree on everything, then we're never going to win. They disagree, particularly when crises happen, when there's multiple different ways to try and achieve something. And it's like like a good a good example of it is a, one example that's often given, where you, what the point that you said earlier, Shibu, about like for the bourgeoisie, this is a democracy. And that's true, right? Because like what they have is everyone gives the examples of lobbies 
to show how corrupt this this system is and that's absolutely true from our standpoint as proletarians right it's not true for the bourgeoisie because like multiple different lobbies contradict each other and argue different things and different interests competitive interests within that so it's not that they're all acting as one it's that what the the state agrees upon is that the, the maintenance of their power to be able to run society as their debate dictates just like you know you go to your community you want them to vote for you they're doing the exact same thing except their community of fucking millionaires and billionaires who have gotten a lobby for them there's no difference Bingo. yeah I mean, that's what liberal democracy is, right? Liberal democracy exists to settle disputes between the capitalist class. Yeah, precisely. Fucking, this fucking world. And if you want, like, a great example of that is just Trump, right? Like, the sort of mainstream bourgeois hated him, right? Like, that's the whole point. That's his all. That's how we managed to get rid of, get, um, get off the whole, you know, I'm just a common man type of thing, and I'm going to go in there and drain the swamp and smash the system and all that jazz, right? I mean, he, he genuinely did split he represented a completely different section of the bourgeoisie, for sure. The sort of traditional, you know, sort of uh, technocrats weren't with him. They just ultimately weren't on his side. And that is why you saw um, uh, four years of what you saw, essentially, right? Like um, the, the media coming after him, essentially. And that doesn't mean he didn't do a lot of the stuff they said he did, but it, you know, actually shows that that was a split in the bourgeois class. And, you know, that's how it manifested itself. I just want to throw in as well that fast, I'm probably cutting in earlier, but when we talked about cultural hegemony, I mean, I don't know whether Gramsci actually said this, but it was in your Dying Culture documentary where in like a Gramsci film, somebody, a prisoner had said to Gramsci, Man is born free and is everywhere in chains. It would be nice if it was as simple as that. Shake off our chains and we'll all grow like flowers. Are you not just playing with words there? I've got to be careful that words don't play with us. What if we took a more organic view? What if the chains were part of us? I don't follow. I'm talking about our culture. What made us in the first place? To grow, we've got to absorb that, understand it. And of course, a bit of fertilizer helps. I still don't see what you're driving at. Yes, you do. Instead of putting us intellectuals up on a pedestal, think of us as chicken shit. Good for the ground. Or ought to be. I wish we could physically break the chains around us and then be free, but it's ideological. The chains are in our mind. That's cultural hegemony basically summed up to like a five-year-old. I think that, yeah, that's a really good, I love that film, by the way. Um, that, that bizarre, that Gramsci documentary is actually by the BBC, um, no as bizarre as that is. Um, and the interviews a lot of people who like knew him and things in between the dramatization. So it, yeah, no, I, really enjoyed that it's available on youtube i'll link it in your discord after i'm so glad that you've done that bit on, on gramsci i swear i'm so that's like one of my favorite parts it's so well done i, I love it because just because of how much i love gramsci it's um, so crucial if nobody's listened to gramsci or has this conception of cultural hegemony you've got to learn it it's like it's no shit it's you've got to learn that ideological uh, framework where he, he focuses on culture because you know marx talks about the base and the superstructure and the superstructure building culture uh, gramsci reflects on what is culture exactly and so like you need that um, as well one tidbit before we just move on, because I know you want to move on, comrade, but I just want to kind of throw this in because this is probably I'm, my favourite. I'm happy. I'm, I'm just thinking of your turn, but please go on. Oh, I'm, I'm really enjoying the discussion, don't worry. I'm just saying I, one, of, one of the things I really want to throw in is that both Gramsci and Marx were disabled, and I think that's a, a really important feature of their political outlook, actually. Really? Um, in what way? So Gramsci had a hunchback, it was in kind of had huge problems with like balance and pain. Mm. Um, as a child, he was hung from the rafters of his childhood home because that was viewed as a common way to treat hunchbacks. So he just strung up from the ceiling for hours on end. And that's kind of his disability. And obviously he experienced quite a huge amount of alienation from society due to that. Marx had a skin condition. Yeah, he had boils and that, didn't he? Yeah, but they... Um, were debilitating in the yeah. sense that he'd be, you know, you read these reports, for example, by the spies that monitored him, 
where they say things like he, he writes he frantic goes into frantic activity and then lies around for days on end and they <laughs> try to portray it as like bohemian yeah. actually like he's exhausted himself and he's trying to get his energy back and he's in agony for those days where he's lying around and i really think that's another really key perspective to throw in because you know mark marx particularly if he hadn't had angles wouldn't have existed as a theorist mm-hmm. it wouldn't be so well regarded he's the most important one of the most important writers of the 19th century whilst at the same time being the most important disabled theorist ever i would say um right. and i think that's that's something that we need to like i, I want to kind of throw out on this podcast because i feel like it's something that we need to reclaim about marx um yeah. and about gramsci as well what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually skip a couple of questions and then go back to them afterwards. Seeing as we're talking about disability, what I'll do is go on to this next section because we talk about like people need to understand whenever they hear somebody is disabled, they've got some kind of disability, a disadvantage, anything like that. What that comes with is not only mental health problems, you know, lack of confidence, depression anxiety it's always physical as well it's physical pain it's not being able to move about you know you're flipping disabled you know what i'm saying you're not able to do things and it's painful so Marx obviously he couldn't go to sleep at night all the time because he's got fucking boils all about around his back and his wife's having to pop them let's just move on actually to this bit here because we always give our patron supporters from any tier, from the $1 plus, the opportunity to ask our guest a question. So we've got one here that comes from the deepest part of Comrade Emily's heart. But before I ask it though, let me just sincerely thank you for your outstanding work on camps of dependency, as well as your frequent posting on ongoing eugenics, social engineering campaigns in the UK against the elderly and the disabled over social media, Twitter. I think that I can thank you on behalf of the disabled, the elderly, many of those lumping, frankly, because there's not many others who've touched on this vicious opportunism from the COVID pandemic, which the ruling classes are all too happy to exploit. So, I mean, yeah, it's just really phenomenal work. I know that it is materially a form of solidarity felt in the heart of the elderly, disabled comrades out there who were unfortunately, I'm going to say it, ostracized lump and proles from left-wing organizations too, revolutionary organizations, you know, groups who were shunned or belittled from activism in real life despite the revolutionary potential. I mean, you just, you just said Marx and, you know, Gramsci, there's like some of the oldest examples. I mean, we can't afford to deny this revolutionary potential. We can't afford to deny any. I mean, we are living in an extinction event, after all, that we do somewhat have a chance to prevent. So, like, I highlighted yet another class of the Lumpen who come to Revolutionary Lumpen Radio because of the solidarity. That solidarity is so rare because of this bourgeois morality that the working class or uni students have in these communist clubs across the world today in imperialist nations. The questions from one of our beloved Patreon supporters, and I ask people to remember that this comes from practical experience as well. You know, after the heartbreak, the alienation that's been suffered from so-called comrades on the left, I mean, this is no bullshit. This is what the lumpen class are going through, this alienation and ostracization from privileged motherfuckers who aren't even dialectical materialist, scientific socialist. We need to think of that. And, and again, just as much solidarity as you show them, camps are dependent to the disabled and the elderly. It's, it's a resource for others to just get a glimpse, a tiny little taste of eugenics and social engineering, which is going on in the world. And we have to understand it if we're ostracizing, lumping, disabled, elderly, anything like that from our orgs. We're part of that eugenics campaign. It's social eugenics and we can't be doing that shit. It's insane. So again, just remember, it comes from practical experience, alienation, ostracization. Emily, welcome to Revolutionary Lumpen Radio. Hi, guys. I've been listening um, acutely and I went on from Disability Twitter, which is a group of disabled activists. Um, I call collectively disabled Twitter because you get like LGBT Twitter or Black Twitter or 
pool person caught up Twitter. Yeah. And your camps of dependence is what I've been talking about since. Sorry, <laughs> not sure it's um for um a couple of years when I got radicalized with basically having a visible, well, not so visible, obvious disability and uh, being autistic and other forms of neurodivergence. And a lot of that is very similar. I don't know if you use that as a reference of a very capitalist condition in the history and politics of disability, where it's a Marxist take where, where a lot of the beginning of that film. And I feel heard because Shabby knows and a couple of other people know in this thing somewhat my story um and we'll, mm. hopefully in a later date we can go into that <laughs> cough cough yeah, um definitely. but it's one of those things where that is not seen the the that there's um labor theory of social relation which is coined by um marcia russell in one of her essays called capitalism and disability where she says that disabled people are inherently disabled and ostracized because of a lack of ability to work in your video very astutely and thank you for doing that video and saying that it's a Marxist and a socialist problem to deal with disability mm. and maybe it getting ostracized and people not seeing disability as an, as an, as an oppression. Um, so for me really my main question I would put to you James and anyone also in this pod would be how would you get the left in the Marxist tradition, that means like anarchists, communists, socialists, etc. To stand behind disabled people and stop the marginalization of disabled people. And the reason why I say that is often we're not seen as having political capital, like people of colour or LGBT people or um, what have you as relatability or able to, to, to feel good. I've, I've, I've had very few people wanting to come out against Atos or <laughs> the DWP um, versus going out to like the, you know to to other events that are f fashionable, mm, and I can and, and I can talk yeah, about that in a lot in the other date um, in depth for references. But I just want to kind of your thoughts on how we can poke and prod um, people in the Marxist tradition because don't like seeing left because people say left and think liberal and all that kind of crap um, because they're fixated on workers you know this worker that worker this worker and I feel alienated from that so it's like how, how can we bring in disability as an oppressed group and have a Marxist analysis of disabled people so I'll, I'll shut up and <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, James, before you respond, can, can I just ask you to basically re react to what was said before the question, please? And then answer the question. Yeah, of course. Um, sorry, I'm just composing myself. Uh, first of all, thank you for asking the question, Emily. Um, it's, uh, I don't, I've, I said this to Shippy before I came on, but um, Camps was a really meaningful film for myself um come from a background of disabled family um i would identify myself as a disabled marxist um i don't want to go into why uh, that's something i keep discreet to myself but um yeah it's quite a cl close question to my heart and um the alienation of disabled people from society is incredibly profound and incredibly meaningful and the exclusion from from labour is its is its is its crux because whilst we've had you're quite correct to say um because whilst we've had you know earlier forms of vile behaviour toward disabled people and specific types of disabled people for example there were periods in in Rome and Greece where disabled children with visible disabilities were killed and we've had periods uh, where you know uh, there's even been periods in the past where there was a market in creating um children with physical disabilities um particularly dwarfism to behave as jesters we've never had a systemic exclusion and all capital kind of controlled society and that manifested in some of the most awful violence that has like frankly not been dealt with in our movement in a lot of ways so i mean one thing that people don't know about 
for example, even the Industrial Revolution, everyone has a kind of view of the Industrial Revolution where, you know, it was brutal, but, you know, it was still the birthplace of civilization in a lot of people's views in Britain. And, you know, what they did to disabled children during the Industrial Revolution was they locked them in basements and left them to die in them. And that issue wasn't taken up by the labor movement, even then. So I, I completely understand where the question comes from. I feel incredibly moved to know that you felt heard. That that moves me immensely. Um, and it means a lot to know that this film has, has, has registered with who, who it's about, um, I think is the key thing for me, because I've had a lot of disabled activists since it since it went out, come getting in contact with me and saying that much the same as what you've said. And it's always, I always have a very quite, I emotionally react to it quite a lot because it, I'm glad that it served that purpose because that's what I wanted it to do. I wanted it to try and give a voice to that section of the Lumpen and the working class because it, it's a section that very rarely has a voice. In terms of the question itself then, um, it's a difficult one, um, and I think we first need to be upfront that this isn't a problem with any one organisation on the left. I've been around the left in Britain, Marxist left in Britain, quite a while now, and they're all disabled as fuck, pretty much. I'm not going to name any kind of organisation, but it's it's a question that it receives very little analysis. It's treated as a matter of benefits at the benefit of the welfare state, if anything, and. The kind of reasoning that people kind of give for what would happen under socialism is kind of just, oh, they'd be taken care of rather than any kind of liberatory statement. Um, it's a question that it's very hard to get people to think in, about. Um, and I've gone through a number of different periods where I had different degrees of hope for this. So, I mean, there was a moment in response to austerity following 2008 where disabled peoples against the cuts appeared to be gaining leadership of the more radical wings of the anti-austerity movement. And that that seemed to kind of be pushing things forward. Unfortunately, Corbynism happened and we were, the disabled people's movement was turned into an electoral prop that was swiftly abandoned after that. I had a lot of hope for this, a new way, the new wave of student activism at first and particularly the people who brought in intersectional ideas, because I thought finally someone's going to actually deal with this question. It's a difficult critique to make, but I think it's one that we need to make, that actually what has resulted is every single oppression but disability is, in, is kind of included in those intersectional analyses these days. You know, it's very rare that you see disability noted as an, a characteristic of oppression or a, an oppressed group. And I think that's a really difficult question to wrestle with because in every instance we have been excluded. Um, the disabled people's movement has been excluded from more traditional organizing. It has been excluded from all these different things. Um, and where we have been active or where our organizations have been strong, like disabled people against the cuts, we've been suppressed ideologically and turned into useful tools for the Labour Party. Now, that leaves us with the very difficult question of how do we actually burst through that situation? And I wish I could give a simple answer, but I think it begins with really setting out that class analysis of what disability is as a form of oppression among the disabled people's movement itself, because there are a lot of different views of what disability is that we still need to kind of deal with, then we need to begin to make concrete demands as a disabled people's movement. And I think that can only actually come outside of the left by communists working in the disabled people's movement, as we saw in the ILM in the 1970s in Britain um, and 1980s. You know, we saw a huge disabled people's movement in America and in, and in Britain and across the globe as well through that period where disabled people took organization into their own hands, banded together to try and construct uh, collectively owned forms of care in the form of independent living centers and tried to 
it demands from that basis. So you need a combination of things. You need a disabled people's movement that is willing to act organisationally independently. That I think has to come in the form of new organisations because even the organisations that formed since 2008 have gradually ossified as a result of Corbynism. And that's just an uncomfortable and difficult reality. And then you need to start trying building physical power bases by um, getting some form of care centre together, collectively owned, to form as a kind of base for those disabled activists. And then you need to start kind of making demands and making them not just at, articulating those demands, not just at centres of power like councils or the government, but also articulating those demands at the left and shaming them where they exclude us and directly being confrontational about it. As difficult as that is, the fact that we have a left that is so comfortable to either completely ignore eugenics in Britain on a scale like we've seen through the COVID pandemic, or to treat it as a kind of paternalistic pursuit. Both of those things are absolutely shameful and need to be challenged actively in a confrontational way. We need to be clear with them. But, you know, I've read a lot of newspapers of the British left coverage of the care crisis in Britain. It's, it's chalked up to incompetence. It's chalked up to lack of resources. All the disabled aren't even mentioned. And it's, it's turned into a conversation about the work, wages of care workers. And all of those things need to be directly and antagonistically challenged. I think the Disabled uh, People's Union that we've seen come up recently could be used as a vehicle with that if we organised quickly. If not, then it will have to come from more localised contexts um, where collectives of us that actually have physical bonds to each other and can meet can work together because it's a very difficult context, it's a very difficult circumstance and I don't think that we're going to just ideologically change people's minds without waging political campaigns against that inactivity. I hope that answers your question, but if there's anything else you want me to expand upon, please do say this is a really important question and it's one that like the left is buried for a long time and it's not even just buried like traditionally like in the past the marxist movement has even allowed eugenicists in some of our parties in some of our trends hmm. um and i don't think that has ever been defeated within our movement frankly yeah like hg wells like hg wells was a eugenicist a lot of people don't really realize that and he was in the fabian society um in fact the Sorry to interrupt, but the uh, James, you remember full there? Sorry, I uh, wasn't sure where I could interrupt. Uh, it was just one of those um, things where, for example, the Atlee government with the NHS and the Beveridge report was eugenic speaked in of deserving, undeserving poor. There's this whole thing where there was actually a lot of sympathy to the useless eaters kind of thing in in Nazi Germany, and a lot. There's actually a lot of interesting stuff which I want to bring up at some point. Um, if and when we <laughs> we get a podcast uh, about the interesting stuff of like child of of, of child psychiatrists in the early revolutionary period before Len before uh, Stalin took over of dealing with kids that were maimed and hurt during the the the, the civil war and how to integrate them and 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 a lot of the ideas of disability politics of of empowering them got kind of lost during the Cold War and during. Um, the 1930s but I think what it is is that it's something that's talked about in the end of Slock's book in a very capitalist condition I think is each according to their needs right and their ability that gets turned into a weapon because that's used of well you use up more than you give your ability is less than, than what you actually need so it becomes weaponized subconsciously and ideologically on the left. So I feel there's a lot of issues of what I like to call, um, and I, I can, I'll talk about this later on, but, it, 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 you know, it, I'm talking about disability and stuff on the left and what experiences, but it's one of those things where it's like, um, you don't work in this fetishization of workers, of work and working pride and, and all this, but it's like, well, what if you can't work? period like me due to my neurological disabilities why can't i uh, you know in the whole i can very briefly talk about you know the national care service bullshit of with, with, with the party i'm involved in i'm in scotland what i need to deal with where even like the, 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 the policy is actually against the law because in british law the needs because the un convention of disabled people's rights 
you need to have disabled people organizations part of it. You need to have other NGOs of the actual people affected by that, such as people, the old people in other unions and, uh, and stakeholders, and they're not did that for that policy or the policy decisions. So I'll quickly say that I see that as an extension of this paternalistic, we'll take care of you, not actually, and, and even eugenics, like um, the guy from the Vara Media that wrote the book Clutch of the Communism, right? He's got eugenics built into his book. I don't know if you noticed that, of oh, gene editing and most diseases are genetic. That's actually not true. There's actually been a census that 84% of all disability in the, in, in the world, including the UK, are acquired, not actually naturally born by genetics. So it's this kind of thing of, oh, well, you know, our world we want to be is you, you're, you, you, you don't exist. That's seen as liberatory of you don't exist rather than the actual material conditions. And my last point is actually, for me, disability politics, like radical disability politics that I've been involved in for the past four years, is the most materialistic, scientific, ground level of what people need to actualize and in the Maslow's high level needs of getting to the point of being independent, um, not dependent on each other, or on somebody in, in, a, in a parasitic way, which you outlined in, in very well in um, your documentary, where it's a dependence of somebody helping you rather than someone helping you being independent and having your own life. I'm just gonna wow, yeah, I, that's news to oh, me. Yeah, like, yeah, honestly, yeah. That, that's good that you just underlined that fact there and that kind of went over my head, thanks. No, it's fine. And, and, and I think because you're not, I've got support workers and stuff and there's a very different mechanism than care. With the, you've, but even then, it's, I need to ask them when I can go out. Um, but do I have enough budget for it? Can I go because my Tourette's, I can have tick attacks and my autism and other emotional st issues I've got. So it becomes almost like chaperoned because of the hostile society and, and hate crimes. So it becomes a bit like, oh, you know, asking your mum or can I go to such and such? Am I allowed to stay with our friends? Very kind of that almost like asking permission to have a life. And when... They've not actually asked anyone in the care service or, or stakeholders or anything that had interviews and all these managerial buggers, uh, well, excuse my language, fuckers that are basically, you know, um, you know, like doctors or managers or former managers of the NHS that, you know, or bosses or MPs or you name it. And yet they've, they've had like five videos. Of, I'm not going to name the socialist party because I'm going to get a bit of a, 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 a beating around the ears because I'm trying to get them up the arse. Um, as a disabled member of their party, I didn't get an invite um, to any of that fucking shit but the care service. Surprise, surprise. So part of me is like, nothing about is without us. Like, I'm not going to sit here as a disabled person <laughs> fuck, um, as part of their party has been in that since 2014 for the independence movement up here in Scotland to then have them impose a policy that will directly affect me and friends. Like, sorry for this long tidy, but it's like, where's the independent living? Where's in the community living? Where's actually questioning the paradigm? And this is where my free thinking, th you know, my, my th you can see I'm quite free thinking. It's like, where's the discussion on breaking up the paradigm of care, the noun of care? You don't say taking care of the blacks, right? Or taking care of the gays, right? Or, 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 or right? It's, it's this really poisonous word we have with a profession or the caring profession, right? And I'm just sitting there going like, what the hell do you actually mean by care? Like, it's this whole thing of control and venomous thing of we're just going to, we're just going to, dictate what your life is and your political life is and and your views and stuff like that and if you don't like it then that's just the way it is and that's my, my main point is that th there's this element of we know best for people not disabled of bill seven in, in canada where it's basically anyone disabled can basically kill themselves can ask to get them to kill themselves called you know assisted suicide which is like a freaking orwellian word and um, even people with mental illnesses so you've got this eugenics kind of we prefer you dead and alive like imagine you, and 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 this is where i get the frustration i mean and i can talk about it later a later episode but it's let's take it that's why you get frustrated it's like you're up in arms about don't eat floyd and Black Lives Matter and police shootings, which is all horrible, and the death and 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 the, the politics about blackness and everything. I got black family and, and 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 seeing it in person. But then it's like, 
a whole genocide, and I mean a literal genocide, of disabled people, which you acutely see in, in that amazing, condensed, really articulate video, James, is not discussed. I even did, I've got a full videos about it, which you, if you want it, I've got a talk. Uh, ironic, it talks. I've done talks about this, but even the environmental mo- movement, the eco-fascism, where it's like, oh well, some people are just not meant to survive. I've actually p- had people say that to my damn face, right? Talking about people not sur- you know, the right to be rescued, and like dying by 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 climate change, and now with COVID nineteen, and it's like. So my life hasn't got any value, and yet that devaluation process, which is a process, you see it with the black community or the people, person, people of color community or LGBT community or what have you, uh, migrant community, but you don't see that process with disabled people. Why is that? So it becomes this whole issue where. I think what it is is that a lot of disabled people are just isolated, you know, and I got I get so angry because I had friends, I had half literal food delivered to them in my disabled charity um, in Glasgow, run by disabled people of like, you know, always they would starve. I've known two people have died because of carers that didn't give a fuck and just, they knew they're infected, they tested positive and came in anyway and they got infected. And it's like, you know, I knew personally um, disabled people, like I worked with, as you know, as, as disabled activists. So for me, it's very really hard to go. You're you're basically this, you know, and it's I'll end here because I don't want to go in a big huge, like you know, hour long tired tired aid. I'm going to need to save my energy. Ironically, I've got a, a talk later on <laughs> tonight. Actually, believe it or not, but it's kind of like that King quote. Um, I do like when liberals quote King because he called, he told he, he told the uh, liberals where to stuff it. You know, so they're actually the greatest threat to to progress to black people. Whenever I say that to liberals, when they've ever the quote <laughs> King, they kind of go silent and and give me the evils, um, word for word. But anyway, he said, "Is we remember not the vo- not the the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends," and that's what I remember now during this whole crisis where 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 we're dying. And, and suffering and had 10 years of it and the silence of those that supposedly are friends is what upsets me and thank you so much for your videos and also other I hope this inspires other comrades to get a, a good massive lever boot up their arse to basically <laughs> to do to, to actually have that and I'm tempted to go into other shows and everything like that to talk about this because it's it's completely missing from the debate. So thank you for having your time on, and I'll leave it there because I don't want to <laughs> cannibalize the the show. It's your show, but I'll I'll, I'll leave it there. So and um, just before we move on, I just want to say solidarity, sister. Of course, we'll get you back on to give people another kick up the ass. But no, it's really life experiences I want to underline for people. And if anybody has just listened to that. Listen to Comrade Emily, Comrade James, and not actually just really got an upset. Then you need to go back and listen to it again. This needs to sink into everybody's fucking head, seriously. Yeah. So Emily's completely correct on the depth of this kind of erasure and this poisonous ideology of productivity. Because that's what it is, right? Everyone has internalized this Mm -hmm. productivity ideology that we are in that calculation that, and I think you, you said that very well, this calculation about from each according to their ability to each according to their need, then there's a cost benefit analysis that goes on in a lot of people's heads and produces this absurd view that communism will liberate everyone but the disabled who will simply be cared for replicating this complete and utter, abs- well, the, the fundamental relation of disabled people's oppression. Now, I think there's a number of reasons materially why that happens. And the first is that disability appears across all genders, ages, uh, colours, everything. Um, And that leads to, it it is a relation of oppression in in every capitalist society and within every group of capitalist society. And that's something that needs to be highlighted because that makes it appear natural in people's heads, Um, despite the fact that it is an incredibly new phenomena as a form of uh, social oppression that arose with capital. The other point I, and so I think what reflects there is how deeply capital has sunk into people's souls, for lack of a better word, and how its logic has been so deeply replicated among them. To the people in other social systems, 
disabled people were part of family production, for example, and what is done to, to disabled people now would have been considered absolutely abhorrent to them. And I think that's something that we need to set out quite clearly. Yeah. The other point I would say is you did a good job of illustrating quite how deep that poison is on the left, but I think you left out one tendency, which is really quite an important tendency. Kolontai was a eugenicist. Kolontai of the Bolshevik party was a eugenicist, and there was, in fact, a eugenicist wing within the Bolshevik party for a considerable period after seizing power as well. So I think that's something that we need to like say, this is a ubiquitous trend across all forms of left or right politics, that there are eugenicists, there are disabilists, and that is a very difficult thing to reckon with, and how we deal with that is very hard, but we do need to confront people. And you're correct again when you say the solution really isn't about more care, it's about giving people the resources they need to live and giving them autonomy and control over them, because it's not just any decision without us, it's also the limits of what those decisions are, are set by who owns that, whether it's the state or the disabled people's movement itself. Um, and how those fractions can be played off against each other, even under socialism, is incredibly difficult to talk about. So just thank you for your anger. Um, I think there are a lot of contradictions that arise among oppressed communities from discussing about disability that are hard to talk about and perhaps beyond the political understanding of a huge section of the left, frankly, and would just degenerate into mud flinging matches. So I think we do need to have those kind of confrontations, but we need a really well constituted disabled people's movement in order to do that. Thank you for your contributions, Emily. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's also like incredibly important to note that this conversation is happening the same week that the UK government is literally issuing do not resuscitate orders on um, disabled uh, COVID patients. So and that's the third time they've attempted to do it during the pandemic, and um, they were successful this week. So they are now issuing do not resuscitate orders on to, you know, d disabled people um, with, with COVID. So. Oh, my God. I mean, yeah, so that's what the state does about it. But what us proles are doing to each other regarding this flipping phenomenon of, of of the disabled the eugenics you know we have to combat eugenics like we have to combat fascism and you know it kind of in a way is fascism it's blatant op oppression it's blatant murder just a point there that you made where it's capitalism in people's souls I, like i think i'd expand on that i think that what it is just like any lump and pole whether it's the criminal element sex workers this that like it's literally people turning the other way because it's so convenient for them to not look and care about people in prison and care about people who who were being cared for it's so much more convenient that they just go throughout their entire lives because guess what they're gonna get upset they're gonna have to empathize they're gonna have to want to change things so it's it's the fear of being uncomfortable and we've got to struggle we can't just go and organize and do this shit and it's just easy and it's not a struggle. I mean, we've got to be with the fucking most oppressed first. Think about your own life. If you, if you had people taking care of you, making all your decisions, what is there to life? Really? And almost all the social programs we set up take care of us. Or put us away in institutions to be cared for. The most evident examples of this are psychiatric wards or care homes, which structure the entirety of a disabled person's life, decide upon treatment without consultation, and will not allow release at the request of those they entomb. These are prisons where humanity is shuffled to death's door under the guise of kindness. No longer allow the government to up oppressed disabled individuals. We want the law enforced. We want no more segregation. We will accept no more discussion of segregation. And I would appreciate it if you would stop shaking your head in agreement when I don't think you understand what we are talking about. To underline the fact that what we're talking about here is solidarity 
I mean, we need socialism. We gotta have solidarity with the poles, workers, poles. You know, we don't care. You know, flipping middle class. We need solidarity. We need love. Do you remember in Che's motorcycle diaries where he actually swam across a, a river in the Amazon to go and be with lepers, and these lepers had been ostracized on the other side of the river from this medical base, and nobody would touch them. Nobody would go near them, and. Che play football with them. These lepers and everybody's like mind had been blown. But you know, le- leprosy is not contagious. So he was like, Are you insane? Like, why don't you just play with them? And and then they all had a good game of footy. You know, that's that love in, in the soul. A true revolutionary is guided by love. What are you if you're not a revolutionary? You're just a reactionary. People have to watch camps of dependence, share it like a do all of that shit because it, it needs to go out there. I mean, you could underline all of this by just the final sentence on camps of dependence. If you don't have the love to care for these people, to be uncomfortable, to sympathize and empathize, to feel as they feel so that you're moved towards a progressive place in space and time rather than, again, receding into a fucking your comfort zone, then what, what the fuck are we doing here? You know, like, what, what are we doing if we're not, if we're not like, supporting and bringing solidarity and connecting these classes and fucking arguing over history? We need to be more than this, honest to God. I'll denounce everybody now who is not supported of them. If, like, there's comrades who want to come out and organise, even fucking sell your newspapers or give your fucking leaflets to the hurricane if there's disabled people, bring a fucking chair, be conscious of the fact that people might need to sit down, bear these things in mind, fuck me. As you'd have heard, there was extremely motivated activists. I mean, they're fighting for the fucking lives here, for God's sake. I mean, we're fighting over economics and, and like money to survive, but fuck me, these are fighting for for literally the fucking life and in a system. I mean, we've done that episode with Dumbledore's social democracy and moderate wing of fascism. It's eugenic social engineering. This is no shit. You're literally got bourgeois morality. If you're fucking thinking like this, we've got to be better than it. Honest. I mean, I'm fuming, obviously. Fucking hell. Emily as well. We'll definitely get you back on the show. And what I was going to do with you is do a disability and Marxism series to highlight all of this. But I think... <laughs> This one could be called Disability and Marxism 1, and yours will be the second one. James, I'd just like to ask as well, like if you ever have a a good potential guest for that series, please send them my way. Any listeners, you are disabled in any way, shape or form, and you want your message here, then what you're going through, your experiences to fucking drilling in these fucking people's heads, definitely get in touch with us. We would love to platform you. Okay, I'll be like two minutes before we do the next couple of questions. Because, yeah, there's like so many things you can you can talk about with that, right? Like the whole DSM thing, I could just talk about for ages. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For me, it's more, I, I almost call it like being a, behind a glass wall. They're getting uppity and genuine passion and, and you uh, see their tears and upset. And then when I talk about it, it's all, oh, that's a shame. I'm like, fuck off. <laughs> like, you know, and there's um, so an excellent video. I posted in videos at some point. I forgot to put it on. She's uh, disabled hard lefty and she and Nixon uh, one about um, capitalism and disability but in it she talked about the just world theory so what happens is that someone's powerless and they are watching something suffer they basically to emotionally cope they devalue that person so that, well, that's what's happening with disabled people is that we're so marginalised and so oppressed and so fucked that when they see us they literally say well you must deserve it you must have done something or are you disabled what do you expect and it's actually a very similar process that happens with racism of immigrants of black people or people of color um lgbt people mm-hmm. so they go oh, you must have done something and that's a, a phenomenon they've done out of studies right. af- over and over and over again i mean it's what happens when you have like an individualist ideology sorry before you continue i wanted i, I can't believe i missed this point out but you said there was an, an NHS meeting that, that you weren't invited to. Absolutely disgusting. Those comrades should be absolutely ashamed. In fact, they're not comrades of mine, unless they obviously understand the, the implications. But look, th- what I see that is, if they're going to these meetings to make it look like they care about the NHS, to make it look like they care ab- about disabled people, but they're not inviting you. I see that as interpassivity or virtue signaling, you could be called it. 
yeah, it's not um, the NHS, it's a national care service. National care service. So yeah. We're going to model it on the NHS. I'm like, you do know that MINCAP, I've got the study I can post, like before the pandemic, like 2,000 people with autism and learning difficulties were actually um, dying by neglect and sometimes even actually um, murdered by doctors per year. And that's the ones we know about. So we go, oh, we're going to model the NHS. You mean the same NHS that's like the most class fucking um, infiltrated of the middle class and bourgeois fucking politics apart from journalism? You mean that kind of NHS? You mean the NHS that quite literally um, stopped all fucking care for disabled people? Um, and, uh, and and the whole fucking thing of like, you know, the Windrush generation of, oh, you denied, if you crack your head, you're fucked. Right, if you're if you're part of the Windrush generation, right, and all of a sudden like you're 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 non-person, you're an really non-person all of a sudden to the state, right? So I'm like, okay, wait, right, so you're gonna model it on on the fucking this BB mm-hmm. called the NHS then, right? Okay, <laughs> like, <laughs> wait, I just laugh. I go, oh, you mean that NHS? You mean that president as a part of of a, of, a, of a war on on undesirables, but by the state? You mean you mean that NHS? You know, like we're just gonna mm. deny healthcare as a weapon. You know what I mean? Like they, they don't see that as like all oh, NHS. These, these doctors, these nurses. You know that almost like demigods. You know, it's like, oh, you know. And I'm like, mm. I'll be buggery. Like my mum's a nurse for thirty years, and it's like, no, like they're she like she had to leave because it's just you know, I'll clap for the NHS. I I crap clap for the NHS. I sure. <laughs> like okay, so if that. I, I, I want to say, obviously, like, talked about, like, obviously, poverty and, like, I had a good friend's mum who worked in the NHS, amazing person, would fucking feed me and everything when man's hungry out here. The individuals in there, boss, you were talking about systemic problems and that's why we've got to fucking topple capitalism. We're mm-hmm. not going to do anything for nobody without toppling capitalism. Welcome back, James. The next question that I was going to ask you is somewhat redundant now. I think it's evident. The question was, why do you think it's important to produce your films and media? Doesn't bourgeois media do a good enough job <laughs> at creating? <laughs> um, okay, I, I have one little thing I wanted to say about this. I have watched Adam Curtis's shit stain of a series that was released recently um, as the, you know... Oh, you went off on a thread? Oh, I did. I'm not done yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, right, so he's the closest we've got to something nominally left-wing, and he's a crypto-fascist, so, you know, who who will say things like, in the last episode, no, sorry, second last episode of that series, he argues that China is responsible for the 2003 Iraq war. <laughs> what? Yeah, 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 yeah. What? <laughs> oh, look. He argues Go on. that... Uh, ISIS is the result of British folk music, and <laughs> and like these are only like this might sound like an exaggeration. It's not. It, if you if you follow the logic line of logic through, Adam argues both of those points, and somehow he still has a career. Um, like Whoa. in any you know, if we lived in a rational media environment, Adam Curtis would be laughed out of all of it. But actually. We had people who watched Hyper Normalization when it came out and thought it was a really good film. In that in that one, he claims that George Osborne is a master of postmodern propaganda who is comparable to Vladimir Putin for reasons. It's all very Oh my god. Yeah. And that's the standard of, you know, quote unquote left journalism, one of the most well regarded left Whoa. quote unquote left filmmakers in bourgeois society. Um, so, wow. yeah, I think we're quite necessary. I think we need lots more channels than just protocol doing this kind of stuff. Because as well, the other thing is that we still live in a video dominant society, where mm. this is how people get their information. Um, yeah. Which is a really important thing to know. Like, you know, we can promote books and newspapers all we want, but like at the end of the day, I'm pretty confident that when I would back when I was selling newspapers, that mm. like 90% of the newspapers I sold were thrown in the bin or used as toilet paper, not out of disregard for the newspaper, but just because who has the time? Yeah, literally. 
I mean, that's the thing with, with videos. I mean, you can be tired, you can be lying on your belly, you know, slobbering from the side of your mouth while watching a, a video when, when, you're, when you're tired, overworked. But you've got to sit up, have a fucking light on and all of that requires a certain setting to read. And obviously, you should try and read when you can. But just to summarise that answer and put it into a way of yeah. saying it, it was because the media that's out there now only propagates people living in an alternate reality in the heads rather than the actual material <laughs> reality which we live in should be here uh, for some reason the audio recording software just didn't record what was said for a moment so on with the show that is actually something i'd love to talk about i mean i doubt we have time but like just like po- postmodernism generally i would love to just like go off on you know what i mean i'm, ha- I'm happy to come on again comrades like if you want to have other Let's do that. Let's do that for sure. Because I, um, I actually, you know, I saw your, um, you know, video on postmodernism, and, and postmodernism is ultimately something I end up like getting into a lot of discussions on people with. Like, um, it's actually probably the thing that I end up getting dragged into the most. So I'd uh, definitely love to talk to that. Talk yeah. to you about that. Bosh, we'll we'll, we'll definitely arrange something. So, I mean, pretty much one final question here. In fact, almost two. Sorry, I saw something on just, this is like a personal inquiry. I saw something about that person that you just talking about on Twitter. Did he copy something to do with your Pokemon scene? I don't want to say copied it because I can't confirm that. But there's a couple of bits in his new series that are mm. eerily similar to what I say in the dying culture. Really? Like the Pokemon bits one bit and... Um, it's pretty much verbatim what I said. And the other one is he uses shots from Birth of a Nation, D.W. Griffiths, the KK Hey Our Heroes film. Um, he uses shots from that um, and discusses that as like the birth of a new American mythology, um, which is also like what we say in a dying culture. Um, and like those things are both true. It's just the way they're presented feels a bit odd. He uses the same shots and things like that. So I don't want to say copied, but there's certainly a resonance. What's coming in the future? Can we get a little sneak peek? Uh, maybe you got any plans for other films, projects people can look out for? Yeah, of course you can, comrades. So next up, yes. one that we are working on at the moment is expanding on our analyses in a dying culture and looking at um, what... Digital, the concept of digital feudalism is what the Internet of Things is, and that's the next kind of short film we're doing. We're doing another one this year. We've already planned on uh, transphobia in Britain and the scale that's getting to. We're doing another one. I want to do one on Haiti um, and the revolutionary movement in Haiti. Then one thing we're working on with our patrons, which we've developed through our reading groups is a critique of Engels's origins of the family, private property and the state. I've definitely said those out of order. So we're going to do a film sort of critiquing that and going over the origins of class. Um, and we hope to be writing that collectively with our patrons as well. Thank you for that answer. All of those projects are definitely important and we look forward to it. And both us and our listeners are, are going to support it, of course. So you're only a dollar on Patreon. I think you could probably donate more, can't you? By the way, you can always give us a dollar. So if you've got two dollars in your bank at least every month, send them, send them our way. We're doing, we're doing all right stuff here. We need some goddamn support, people. But if people do support you on Patreon to get access to your Discord, what this Discord enables you to do is access the educational groups. Just curious for people, like what do these educational projects consist of? What can you tell us about them? Okay, so the Discord is, first of all, it's, so we have like a a few channels for discussion. It's a democratically run Discord as well. We have like a motions channel where people vote on any new channels they want to set up or anything they want to do and like any new rules they want to propose, those kind of things. So we try and give as much control of the Discord to patrons as possible just as an entity. The educationals themselves, we've done a number of different things. So I've done an educational program going over. I did like a core Marxist readings in Introduction to Communist Politics, which went over things like what communist views of method are, what kind of what view of imperialism is, what basic kind of basics of Marx's economic critique of capitalism. And those were lectures with exercises in and discussions 
So I'd, I'd sort of speak for maybe 10 minutes on, on a concept and then break for people to ask questions and pose them questions and things like that. Um, so that's one form. We have reading groups now, which we all go through a text chapter by chapter together. We're presently doing Engels's Origins of the Family, Private Property in the State. We're going through that once every sort of week or two weeks. We normally go through that. And we also have educational set sessions where you can just come along and introduce what whatever you're, you've been reading or studying about that last week or month or whenever. And you can give us a, a sort of five minute presentation, and then everyone in the group will break to discuss. Oh, cool. Now, each of those is intended for a different thing. The lecture kind of formats to give like a basic rundown of kind of these are the fundamentals of Marxism, like an introductory course. Then we have the, the the reading group, which is to give a more detailed kind of overview and to develop a more critical relationship with Marx and Engels, where we can like say, oh, we disagree with this bit for these reasons that are now like, say, origins of this of the family is quite an old text dealing with archaeological evidence. So a lot of archaeological evidence has arisen since Engels wrote that. So that's mm. a lot to say. And then the final form where we let people kind of present on ideas, that's intended really to sort of train you up in being confident in arguing and presenting your own ideas, because that's a fundamental skill of being able to conduct politics is being, you know, having that confidence. And a lot of working class people just don't have it. So having a nice kind of friendly, safe environment to like play around with that is hopefully a beneficial thing. And it seems to have worked for a few comrades. And we're also open to any kind of suggestions for other educationals that people want to run. We now have elected educational officer, our first one, which means that it won't just be me conducting educationals or protocol conducting educationals. We, we're broadening that out to patrons to be able to do as well um, if they want to or anyone in the Discord. And yeah, and that is also, and the final thing I would say about that is uh, the reading group around Engels we're using as a basis to do a collaborative film project together with our patrons as well. Boss, uh, dead important, dead accessible for people, um, except me. I flip and I do the Patreon. I wanted to join the educationals and it's never let me into flipping. The Discord servers never come up. This is a, actually a huge problem that we have. I've set up the Patreon bot four different times and after a week it breaks. Um, I don't know why. Um, I have no idea why. But if anyone signs up to our Patreon and doesn't get a link, drop me a message and I'll send you one immediately. Um, so I'll send you one through Shippy, don't worry. Nice one, mate. Yeah, so there you go, listeners. If if you're a supporter of Patreon and you're not in the Discord, that's why. If you don't ask, you, you don't get. So definitely be asking for that link just one more final thing it's the plugs where can people find you how can they support pro cult and do you have any other plugs for our listeners and to include in the show notes so uh you can find us at patreon.com forward slash protocol is our patron um youtube just search protocol i can't remember the html i'm sure it'll be included with the html web address sorry um yeah <laughs> included with the episode um i'm at glumbird on twitter um but you can also follow us at protocol films on twitter and we have protocol films on facebook as well we do technically have an instagram but it's just shit vaporwave art so you know up to you um <laughs> <laughs> um finally i guess uh, the only other plug i would chuck in is i worked on editing a book with the author ted reese a couple of years ago called socialism or extinction climate automation and war in the final capitalist breakdown and we're now at a stage where that is finally going to be available in hard copy to to buy it's only been available as like a digital book but now you can get a hard copy as well we booked him on as a guest i've sent him the script he's next oh bro Oh, excellent. <laughs> cool, that, isn't it? It's a small world. Boss, Dan, thank you very much for your time. We're just going to do a, a quick shout out to all of our supporters who we love so much. And obviously, if nobody listens to this, if nobody supports us to continue to do this, it's not going to happen. So I think we're doing good stuff here. So it's all because of the literal material contributions here in this capitalist hellhole uh, where we've got like, We've got to pay for storage fees, server costs, things like that. Should be, uh, look, we need to be building bases. Comrade James talked about, you know, 
disabled are going to have to have a base to organise from. We need a base. To, like, if I had Vosh, Patreon support, we'd, we'd have a base in the city centre. You'd see it live streaming 24-7. This is what we need, people. All power to the people. Just a big, huge love and thank you to Jake, Joe, RevLeft Radio, Jim, John Gregory, Jessica, Slaughter Round, Gemma, Kate, Mary, Savil, Awu, Sir Mug, Ali, Val, Stephen, Emily, and Eris or Phoenix. Thank you so much. If you do support the show, you get like bonus episodes. And I think that it was great having Emily on today to ask James a question. We do give our guests a chance to ask, you know, a question. So we can either do that on your behalf, you know, if you're a patron and we've got a guest who you really want to ask a question, we're happy to let you ask them yourself. I think that that was cool. I'm glad that we got to give Emily that chance. Our patrons, patreon.com slash lumpen podcast. Twitter is at lumpen underscore radio and we're on iTunes, Twitter, Podbean, everything, whatever you like. Go and support us, like us, share us, give us five stars and everything. What's the point in giving us any less? We're talking about international proletarian revolution here. We want nothing less. So who's going to be critical? And just give us five stars. We need to go up in the algorithm. More people need to listen to us. In fact, actually, I want to thank everybody who has rated us so far on iTunes. And I also want to shout out as well that I've been looking on a couple of different platforms and have searched like revolutionary to see how where we are in the algorithm. Rev left radios at the top. We're like a little bit further down. So let's just bring that up. Well, it's what it's about. Let's connect. Let's work together. This has been Series 3, Episode 3 with Pro Cult. Definitely go and support them. And we'll probably see you in the Discord. If you do, patreon.com slash Pro Cult. Series 3 is about connecting UK comrades, platforms, organizations, good comrades. We want to we wanna connect people here. There's one of the first things I said to you, James, was something about like, it being great to hear like an English voice because again, so much of the politics and that is from the internet and the internet from America. So it's, it's but we need this culture manifesting itself in the UK. No, thank you for having me on. It's been really, really fun. I've really enjoyed the discussion. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah, I think so too. Thank you so much for your time, James. And keep up all the flipping amazing work. Thank you. Solidarity forever. Thank and you. as always, Workers and lumpen of the world unite.